I can remember to do this. Turn me back on, okay? Father in heaven, thank you for the community of faith that gathers night by night in this tent who have been so welcoming of a stranger who's been so receptive to hearing again from another person the gospel of your everlasting love. Thank you for the time that we've had together to open the Bible and to talk about things that are important to us, to reason through our faith together, and to find better ways that we can love you and keep Jesus foremost in our lives. I thank you for each one that's here tonight, for their um, the attention that they have paid to me, to, to the uh, opportunity that I've had to tell great stories from my life and my experience about how my journey has found you and found Jesus and found the gospel of grace. Thank you for this opportunity to share that. And may it be all of our experiences here, we can leave this place not fearful of you, not worried, not speaking of the things on the periphery of our faith, but joyful at the very center, taking up our tambourines and dancing with the joyful. Give us that experience tonight is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All the great conversations we've had, the sweet things that you've said for making a guy like me feel at home in a beautiful place like this. Appreciate it. I, I want to tell you... Um, Honestly, that I was worried about this question and answer thing. I've never done this before. And I, I was worried that um, we might lose you and uh, I might give the wrong answers. It might not be fun. But so many people have said to me, thank you for this. It's working well. So we're going to do it one more night. I picked up a few more questions uh, in the back just before we started. And uh, I will look at them tonight and add that to what I'm going to say tomorrow and Sabbath morning. And so we'll try to get through all of those before we're through. Thank you for being here tonight. I see some of my friends from the big tent in the morning, and I apologize if I repeat a few things. But as I got to the questions, I saw some, some things asked that they were similar to what we've been talking about in the big tent. So um, I, I hope... You don't get up and leave because I might go over a couple of things, same things. Uh, last night, we got a question about how can I get a good SDA man? Remember that one? And I said, it's just a miracle. Well, the miracle has happened because we got a guy who says tonight, how do you find a godly woman? <laughs> These two are matched in heaven right here. Now, if the girl that would ask the question last night and the guy that asked the question tonight would meet just in the outskirts of the tent right after the meeting. We'll see what happens. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we could at least exchange email addresses between the two of you. And uh, it would be kind of fun if we email everybody, watch the romance blossom here in the youth, youth tent, see what happens from that. Um, I, I kind of said this last night, but I'll say it again. I think godly men attract godly women. And I think godly women attract godly men. So the answer for me is not to find the right person, but to become the right person. And then it seems to me that people kind of get together. So um, well, I don't know if you're here tonight. I don't know if we want to know if you're here tonight. <laughs> but uh, maybe, maybe we can talk a little bit later. And if both of you would get together, that would be just awesome. I, I would love 10 years from now that a couple come up to me and say, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary. You know how we got together? It was at youth camp in uh, North New Zealand. I wrote a question. He wrote a question. Wouldn't that be fun? I don't know. <laughs> uh, here was an interesting question that I, I, thought, I thought was um, really insightful and helpful and sweet at the same time. Somebody wrote, how can we affirm others? when so many people are criticizing them. Um, I know that happens a lot. Um, you have, especially musicians, get this a lot, don't they? A lot of criticism. Uh, preachers get it a lot, especially if they talk about grace a lot, they get criticized a lot. I, I would love to share with you sometimes some of the 
some of the conversations I've had on camp this week have been interesting. Most of them just wonderful. A few of them I could have stood a little bit of uh, affirmation when I was getting criticism. It was interesting because we studied the story of of David and his family in the youth tent, in the uh, big tent this morning, and I was telling the people there on the importance of becoming people that encourage other people. And I just like to repeat, pardon me to those of you that were there this morning, how important it is to encourage other people. And one of the best ways to do it is to write little notes of encouragement. And I really wish before you leave camp this weekend that you would write a little note of encouragement to some of these people that put their life on the line every night up here, to all the hard people that work back in the tech booth, to um, the people that are planning the program. And sometimes we go by and we don't even thank them for what they do. And it would just be lovely if you could do that. But when you get home, write a little note of encouragement to the pastor and the staff at your church, to the Sabbath school leaders, to the youth leaders, to the people that, uh, to, who do worship and special items. Just tell them how much you appreciate them. And it's so encouraging to get that kind of affirmation. But I'll tell you a, a couple of little clues about how to do it. Um, I used to tell people, keep it short and be specific. And those were the only rules about writing notes of encouragement. Uh, don't go on for page after page. Just write a couple of sentences and be specific about it. I really liked um, the songs that you chose for the praise time tonight. Just something like that would be good. Or... Um, Thanks to the guys that always pick up the pulpit and put it up here. I, I don't know how often they get thanked, but thank you for what you're doing. Write it real short and then be specific. Include something that is very specific. I was talking to a group of pastors and their spouses one time, trying to get them to write notes of encouragement to people in their churches. I gave them those two rules, short and specific. And I gave them an assignment of writing notes of encouragement and then I collected them from the group and I read them and I critiqued them if they were short enough and specific enough. And I came to one, a pastor's wife, who wrote to the church organist. And the note of encouragement said this, Thank you so much for the prelude you played this week after church. It was so much better than the one you played last week. <laughs> and I added a third rule to writing notes of encouragement. Never connect present encouragement with past misbehavior. So when you say to the organist, I love the prelude, it was so much better than the one you played last week, the organist only hears it was better than the one last week, and they begin to think about, why didn't they like the one I played last week? And what was the matter with it? And then they get mad at you for telling them that you didn't like their prelude last week. So never connect present encouragement with past misbehavior. So you don't say to the praise leader tonight, thank you for leading us to the throne of God in praise. It's about time that you did that. You know, you can't say that. Just keep it positive and people will begin to see themselves in the light that you encourage them. If you don't do that, if you just discourage people, they will continue to act discouraged. I told the people in the big tent this morning, that I had a class of first, second, and third graders one time. The first week of school, I decided I wanted to encourage all of them. And so Friday afternoon after school was out, I wrote a note of encouragement to each one of the kids, except one guy who sat right in the middle, second grader. I couldn't think of a single nice thing to say about him. He'd been a terrible student all week. And I thought and thought, and I, I didn't know what to do. And I remembered that he'd asked me for a new desk because... The chair on his desk had a crack in it, and whenever he wiggled, which was about every 30 seconds in the day, the crack pinched his bottom, and it had hurt him, and he said, please get me a new desk. I kind of thought it was appropriate punishment, but I finally said, okay, I'll do it. I went out, and I got a new desk, and I brought it in, and I put it there, and I opened the, the top of his desk to get the books out, and I noticed that the few books that were in there, five or six books, were stacked one on top of the other. And I had an idea. I put the books in the new desk, took the old desk out, and I wrote a note to him. His name was Robert. And I said, Dear Robert, thank you for keeping your desk so neat. 
You're an example to all of us. I signed my name, and I watched him Monday morning when he came in. He watched all the other kids open their desk and look at their note, and I don't think he thought he was going to get one. And then he opened up, read the note. He stuck his head in the desk, and he read the note, and then he put it down, and he looked around, and he never said a word to me about it. The rest of the school year, he never said a word. But about a month later, his mother came up to me in church, and she said, Stuart, I don't know what you said to Robert, but for the last month, his room has been neat. Isn't that interesting what happened? I, I only said two sentences to him, but I called him a neat person. And he began to think of himself as a neat person. And he kept his bedroom at home neat just because of that one little interaction. And I promise you, if you do the same thing, people will begin to think of themselves like the way that you encourage them. It's a great thing to do. So that's a quick uh, answer to the question, how can we affirm people when so many people are criticizing them? It's a wonderful thing to be an encourager. I have a question about the 144,000. Is it symbolic? If it is, why is the millennium, the thousand years, literal? Shouldn't they both be either literal or symbolic? Um, I don't know much about the 144,000. I'll have to be honest with you. I'm not sure if it's a literal number or a figurative number or the millennium is. It, I've got a theory, but I'm not sure now that I look at the question where I got the idea. But I, I do know a couple things about the 144,000. Let me tell you what they are. In Revelation 7, it says that the 144,000 come from every tribe in Israel. I always love it when the Bible says something like that because I believe it means... When it says every tribe in Israel, I think it means you and I are included in that. It's not just those 12 tribes back then and the 144,000 have to be Jewish people from those 12 tribes. Whenever the Bible says 12 tribes, one from every tribe or 12,000 from every tribe, I think it's including all of us. Uh, we looked in the Big Tent a couple days ago about the story of the children of Israel crossing the Jordan River into the Promised Land. And you remember that through Joshua, God gave the message that there should be a representative from each of the tribe to stop in the middle of the river and pick up a stone and take it out of the river and at the new encampment, put it down and make an altar. I believe that when we read that in the story, we should read, I'm included in this story. Suddenly the story is not just a history story, about what happened when the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River, but it's how you and I get to go into the Promised Land as well. Little clue that I think the Bible lead, leaves us. And so when the book of Revelation chapter 7 says the 144,000 are from all of the tribes of Israel, I think we're included. And I'm not sure how, if it's a literal number, all of us can be included. So maybe it's figurative. But there's another description of the 144,000 in the book of Revelation. It's in chapter 14. And I'm sure what this means. And I'm sure that it applies to you and me just as much as it applies to anybody. In chapter 14 of Revelation, it says the 144,000, listen, follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Now who's the Lamb that we're to follow? Jesus Christ. And if in heaven this group of people called the 144,000 is going to follow Jesus wherever He goes, why don't we start doing it right now? Wouldn't it be great if people out there looked at Seventh-day Adventists and said, ah, the definition of Seventh-day Adventists are people who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. If people would say that about me, I don't care if I'm in the 144,000 or not, I'm following the Lamb wherever he goes, and that's what I want to do. So I, I, I'm sorry, the person that asked the question, I'm not, I'm not authoritative on this. And in fact, I don't think anywhere in the Bible it tells us exactly who these people are. There's some wonderful clues, but the important thing is that you and I are included and we can follow the Lamb wherever he goes beginning right now. I have another question about predestination. I've categorize this into uh, a category of questions about things we don't understand very well. 
And this question says, I hear a lot about predestination. What I want to know is how much active planning God has done and then how much inactive and just life happens to us. So let me try to answer a question about predestination. And in order to do this, I want to go to the book of Ephesians chapter 1 where there's a wonderful passage on predestination. And it starts like this, verse 5 of chapter 1 in Ephesians. God predestined us. I'm going to jump back to chapter 4. In a parallel verse it says, He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. To be holy and blameless in His sight. Now you know the Bible really well. Tell me, who is it in the Bible that is talked about as being holy? It's God. It's Jesus. It's never people. It's ground where Jesus is walking or God has met with us. Take off your shoes, Moses. This is holy ground. Take off your shoes, Joshua. This is holy ground. It wasn't because Moses and Joshua were standing there. It's because God was standing there. Who in the Bible is blameless? God's blameless. Jesus is blameless. Human beings are not considered blameless. But have you heard this passage in Steps to Christ? It's on page 62. And I've quoted it a couple times here already on camp this week. But it's appropriate again. Let me read it to you. And listen about how you and I get to be considered holy and blameless, which Ephesians 1 says that God chose for us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless. The condition of eternal life is now just what it always has been, just what it was in paradise before the fall of our first parents, perfect obedience to the law of God, perfect righteousness. If eternal life were granted on any condition short of this, then the happiness of the whole universe would be imperiled and the way would be open for sin with all its train of woe and misery to be immortalized. I was talking at a camp meeting a couple years ago on the east coast of the States and I was talking about God's grace and a young man came up to me after a sermon and he said, you obviously haven't read Steps to Christ, page 62. And I said, uh-oh, what did I miss? And he quoted this paragraph that I just read to you. Condition of eternal life is now just what it always was, perfect obedience to the law of God. And he was quoting it to me because I was saying that we get to heaven because what Jesus did, not because what we do. He said, you missed Steps to Christ, page 62. And I kind of played along with him for a little bit. And he didn't know that in my Bible, I had a card where I had written out the entire page 62 and Steps to Christ. I said, really, did I miss something? He said, yeah, you missed this. I said, what does the rest of the page say? And he said, is there something else on that page? I reached in my Bible and I pulled out this card and this is what I read to him. It was possible, this is the very next sentence now, it was possible for Adam before the fall to form a righteous character by obedience to God's law. But he failed to do this. And because of his sin, our natures are fallen and we cannot make ourselves righteous. Since we are sinful and unholy, we cannot perfectly obey the law. We cannot do it. We have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of the law of God. I looked at the young man. He was standing there in front of me with his mouth open. He was still almost okay, but now where he had been quoting Steps to Christ 62 to me to say, you better obey the law, I was quoting Steps to Christ page 62 to him to say, but we can't do it because we're unholy people. And I said to him, aren't you glad that's still not the rest of the page? He said, is there more? I said, listen to this. But Christ has made a way of escape for us. He lived on earth amid trials and temptations, 
such as we have to meet. He lived a sinless life. He died for us. And now He offers to take our sins and give us His righteousness. Then I used to read the next sentence. If you give yourself to Him and put all of the emphasis on what you and I have to do. But I think the emphasis is a different place. I think you should read this next sentence. If you give yourself to Him, if you make, if you accept Him as your Savior, instead of giving yourself to yourself to do it, and accepting yourself as a Savior, if you accept Him as your Savior, then, sinful as your life may have been, for His sake, you are accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character, and you are accepted before God just as if you had never sinned. I want to I want to tear that page out and memorize it and quote it over and over again. I looked at the young man standing in front of me. He shook his head and just before he turned to walk away, he said, "Well, so much for quoting the entire page." <laughs> he was a little destroyed and I wondered why because for me this is an incredible promise, isn't it for you? Yeah. So when Ephesians 1 says, he chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. It seems to me that it's clear that the only way that you and I can be holy and blameless is in God's sight is to accept the righteousness of Christ and stand before God just as if we had never sinned. And then the next verse says, He predestined us to be adopted as His children through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will to the praise of His glorious grace which He has freely given to us and the one He loves. In Him we have redemption through Christ's blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavishes on us. It seems to me that predestination means that long before you and I were born, long before the creation of the world, God devised a plan whereby you and I could be saved. God knowing that if left to our own, we could never do it by ourselves. And so even before the entrance of sin into this world, God looked down at your face and my face, and He said, those people won't be able to get back here to heaven without a very special plan that I'm going to put into, into place. And so, before we were born, before the creation of the world, He predestined that the only way that you and I could get to heaven was to accept the righteousness of Jesus and stand before God just as if we had not sinned. God does not say, you have never sinned, I will forget it, because that wouldn't be true. In fact, he says, the penalty of sin is death and Jesus will pay the penalty for them. He doesn't forget the penalty of sin. He doesn't say, I will make you holy. He says, I will treat you as if you had never sinned. You are accounted righteous. I am accounted righteous. We get to heaven because Jesus predestined it that that would be the way it would happen. Throughout the ages, it's been a very difficult concept to understand. Augustine, who was one of the great early people in our church, lived around the year 400, died just after that, could not correlate God's sovereign will desiring us to be saved with the fact that so many will be lost and you can't read the end of the Bible without realizing a lot of people won't make it to heaven. And so Augustine, in order to try to correlate that, came up with a theory called double predestination. And he began to teach, and it became the theology of the church for over a thousand years, that God has chosen some of you to go to heaven, 
and He's chosen the rest of you to go to hell. Double predestination. And it doesn't matter what you do, and it doesn't matter what you do, sit in the camp meeting tent all of your life, it doesn't matter, you have a destiny in hell, that's all that's going to happen. And the church taught that as theology for a long, long time, century after century. We believe that the correlation that goes between God's sovereign will and the fact that some will end up not making to heaven is something we call freedom of choice, free will. God predestined that the only way to get to heaven was to accept Jesus' righteousness, but He will not force Jesus' righteousness on you or me at all. That's a choice that we make. And we can come to God and we can say, I don't want anything to do with what you have planned for me. We can come to God and we can say, look at all the things that I've done. Look, my hands are full of good works. Why don't you save me the way I want to be saved? You treat me like I think I deserve. And Jesus says to us, I predestined in another way. Take it my way. We say, no, here. And God has to look at us and say, I don't even know who you are. Or we can choose to accept salvation the way God predestined it. Accept the righteousness of Christ and stand before the throne of God just as if you had never sinned. Why, my friends, would anybody want to do it any other way? Predestination is about God's will for our life and getting us to heaven. I hope that's helpful. I'm not sure I answered everything in this. But predestination is really a wonderful choice that God puts in front of us. Let me move on to another category of questions. And these had to do about sin and specific sins. One question just simply said, are there varying degrees of sin? Another question says, is one sin greater than another? And then let me read a couple of, um, of questions that are, are more, um, more in detail about them. Listen to this. I'm a reborn Christian who has previously lived a gay lifestyle. I want to live the lifestyle of the Bible and to be the person God intended me to be. What practical tips can you give me? Apart from being tempted less, the desires still seem to be there. I know God has a way out, but it seems so far away. And another one that says that in the church where this person goes, there are two couples and the partners have committed adultery with each other. But both of the couples are still in the church and the question asks, what about that? Let me see if I can um, try to bring a little clarity to the question about sin. Sin is choosing deliberately to rebel against God. If you run a red light, uh, run a stop sign... You may be choosing to rebel against the law of the land and there may be a policeman that deals with you. But sin is choosing deliberately to rebel against God. If you walk out of here tonight and it's dark and you slip on a tent pole and you break your leg, you fall and you break your leg, that may be a result of sin, but it's not a sin. You have not chosen deliberately to break your leg and rebel against God. But if you picked up a a baseball bat or what do you call the thing that the cricketers use? Is that a bat? A a cricket thing? Okay. If If you pick up one of those and you hide around the corner of a tent and you see somebody that you're angry with and in the dark and the mud they're slipping by and you reach out with the bat and you you hit them in the leg and break their leg That's a sin because you're rebelling against God's command to love each other and and not to cause pain to each other. And so the question is, are there varying degrees of sin? Well, if you swing real hard and you miss the legs and you hit somebody in the little finger and you break their finger, or you hit them square in between the eyes and you break every bone in their body, no, there's no degree of sin involved 
Breaking the bones of the other people, whether it's one little finger or every bone in the body, is still sin. And God doesn't sit down in heaven and write, oh, just a little sin, it was just the pinky that he broke. Or, oh, it was a big one, he broke every bone in the body. The result of your sin is different. I would much rather have your sin be a little one than a big one if I'm the guy that you're hitting with the bat. But the sin itself is sin. And in God's eyes, it seems to me, it's clear from the Bible, there are not big sins and little sins. The Bible's not so interested in the sins. It's sin. It's choosing deliberately to rebel against God. Here's another way to look at it. Let's say that a balloon that's been blown, blown up and tied is a perfect life and the sin is poking a pin in the balloon so that you break the balloon and deflate it. Folks, it doesn't matter if you poke a little tiny pin in the balloon or you shoot a surface-to-air missile at the balloon and hit it. Whatever you do, a little one or a big one, it breaks the balloon. You may have used a bigger weapon, but the sin is exactly the same breaking the balloon. You see the analogy? And when it comes to getting to heaven, only unbroken balloons get to heaven. So try as you might to patch things up, patch the balloon up, blow it back up. There's always going to be that hole in the balloon. It's always going to be broken. And we cannot get to heaven if our balloons are broken. The consequences of sin are different. But sin is sin. An assassin who lies in wait with a high-powered rifle along a dark road until a head of state drives down the road and he shoots one bullet into the car and kills the one head of state has committed murder. The consequence of that sin is a murder. A hijacker can hijack an airplane and fly it into an office building and kill thousands of people. And the consequence is different, but the assassination is the sin and it's the same thing. There are no different levels of sin. It's just the results of sin that are different. When it comes to how should we treat people that sin? It seems to me that the Bible is very, very clear. But it depends on the category of sinner. Let me give you, let me give you three possible categories. There are some people who don't know that they need help. Sinners who don't know that Jesus saves them. There are some people who know they need help and they want help. Sinners who know that Jesus is the only way to be saved and they want Jesus to, be, to save them. And then there are people who know they need help but they don't want any help. Sinners who know that they're sinners and they know that Jesus is the only way to be saved and they don't want to have anything to do with it. Let me illustrate the three. People who don't know they need help. One time I was late for getting to uh, an airplane at a local airport and I was uh, hurrying. I bypassed the front counter. I didn't check in a bag. I just ran past the counter, ran up to the gate. I handed my ticket close, uh, quickly to the person that was taking the tickets and she said, you're the last one on the plane. I'm glad you made it. And I said, oh, I'm glad I made it too. And she didn't really look too much. She took my ticket and tore the thing off, you know, and gave it back to me. I ran out, went up the steps, got into the plane, and I walked into the plane, and I always choose the same seat when I fly. Maybe it's because I'm afraid I'm going to get lost when I get on a plane, or I don't know what. But I like an aisle seat, and I like an exit row, so I have a little bit more leg room, and I always get that seat. And as I went into the plane, I realized that somebody else had sat in my seat. And I thought, you know, I will clear it up. my little ticket stub says that's my seat. So I went to that place and I opened the bin and I put my carry-on bag up there and I shut it. And without saying anything to the guy that was sitting in my seat, I walked clear to the back of the plane and I went to a flight attendant and I handed her my, my ticket stub and I said, there's a guy sitting in my seat up there. 
if you don't mind, I'd love to have that seed and put him in the place where he belongs. And she said, okay, I will do it. Don't worry about it. She went back with my ticket stub in her left hand and she tapped the guy in the shoulder who was sitting in my seat and, and she said to him, I think you're sitting in the wrong seat. Would you mind giving me your t- ticket stub? And he unbuckled himself and he stood up and he opened the bin and he hunted through his briefcase. He pulled it down. He couldn't find it for the longest time. People were getting a little bit nervous. This plane was supposed to go. And finally he found it and he handed it to her. She said, thank you very much. And she walked out of the plane and went to clear the things up. And I stood in the back of the plane, I'll admit, rather smugly. My seat was being occupied by a a guy had no business in my seat, and just a moment, the flight attendant would come back and throw the guy out of my seat. He was probably sitting in a middle seat somewhere or by, an aisle, or by a window, and I would get my aisle seat with a little bit extra leg room. And all of a sudden, the flight attendant came back, and instead of stopping and talking to him, she came straight to the back of the plane, and she held up my ticket stub, and she said, Mr. Tyner, you're going to Portland, Oregon. I said, yes, that's right. She said, this plane is going to Las Vegas. I had gotten on the wrong plane. And the ticket agent who pulled my ticket didn't say a thing about it, didn't even look. I was on the wrong plane. See, I needed help, but I didn't know that I needed help. I was on the wrong plane, but I didn't know it. By the way, I had to go back in front of everybody in the plane, open the bin, take my suitcase out. Nice to see you. Sorry about this. Walk out. Walk to the next gate. Walk into the plane. Hand the stewardess my ticket. And she said, it's about time you got here. We've been waiting for you. It was a terrible moment for me, but I learned a lesson. There are people that don't know they need help. Sinners who don't know that Jesus saves them. Where would you like those sinners to be in order to find out that they need help and that it's Jesus that saves them? It seems to me that the place for them is in the fellowship of the church, in the community of faith where you and I can welcome them in and put our arms around them and they look at you and me and we're so happy and we know that we belong here and we know that we're sinners who have gotten salvation from Jesus and we're the happiest people in the world. And those people find out they've been on the wrong plane and now they're in the right plane. People in this category need the community of faith. Please don't turn these people away at the doors of your church. Welcome them in. Be friends with them. Somebody stopped me a couple of nights ago and said, I have a few friends who are in this category. They've kind of left the the church and they're kind of proud about it and I'd like to be friends with them. And I said, here's the the point. When you're with them, do you feel like you don't want to be near Jesus too much? Or is your relationship with Jesus okay? That's something that only you can answer. But if you can be strong in your faith and welcome people into the fellowship who don't know that they need help, please do that. The second category is people who know they need help and they want help. At the same airport, sometime later, I was in my favorite seat and the uh, flight attendant shut the door, made the announcement about how we're taxing out now and, and, you know, went through everything about buckling your seat belts and all those kind of things. And we taxied out to the place in the tarmac where you turn around and then you rev up the engines and you begin to take off. And we just sat there at the end of the flight. We just sat there. I mean, at the end of the runway. And all of a sudden, I looked up, and there was a flight attendant walking through the middle aisle with three little children walking behind her. There was a boy that might have been 10 and another boy that might have been 8 and a little girl that was 4 or 5 years old. And the flight attendant walked up to the to the uh, cockpit door, the cabin door, and she knocked on the door. And one of the captains opened the door and there was a conversation that went on. I could see the flight attendant talking to the pilot, pointing to the kids, talking back and forth. And then the children and the flight attendant turned around and they went back to their seats and the captain came on the intercom. 
He said, ladies and gentlemen, we've had a situation develop in the airplane. I'm going to taxi back to the terminal. We're going to open the doors for a minute. And then we're going to start up again. We'll shut the doors. We'll taxi back and we'll take off. I'm sorry that this might have inconvenienced some of you. I know some of you have connections to make, but I will make make it a, a point to try to make up some time and we'll get you to where we're going as soon as we can. Oh, people started to grumble. What's the matter? What's going on here? What does it have to do with those three little kids? And finally, we got back. They opened the door. The three little children came to the front with their suitcases and were let off the plane. And then they shut the doors. And you know when that happens, you've got to go through the whole thing again, how to fasten your seat belts, bring your chair up to its upright position, what happens if you're in turbulence and the, the mask fall down. We got to the end of the runway. He revved the plane. We took off. And finally, when we were at cruising altitude at 35,000 feet and the seat belt sign came off, the captain came on the intercom. He said, let me tell you what happened. Those three little children have a father that lives in Chicago and a mother that lives in Los Angeles. And they've been here. The boys live with their dad. The little girl lives with her mother in L.A. And the boys have been here visiting mom. And they're just now headed back to Chicago so all three of the kids can live with the dad for a little bit. And as we got to the end of the runway, the little girl became hysterical. And the stewardess felt that we must not go on until she was able to tell the pilot what was going on. And so she stopped the plane and took the kids up and then knocked on the door and the pilot talked to the little girl and he said over the intercom, I have never seen a little girl so frightened in my life. And it wasn't about flying, it was about seeing her father. And I decided that we had to leave her here. We contacted her mother. Her mother's back, coming back to the airport. The kids are going to stay with the mother and let the mother sort it out. I'm sorry it's inconvenienced you. I'll try to make it up. I thought about what had happened and I asked one of the flight attendants to come over and I said, you were the flight attendant that took the kids up, weren't you? And she said, yeah. I said, are you sure the little girl wasn't just scared of flying? Oh no, all she could talk about was she didn't want to see her father. I got a business card out of my own. I wrote a note to the captain and I said, thank you for being sensitive to these little children. If this airline has a lot of employees like you, then they ought to be awful proud. And I asked one of the flight attendants to deliver it to him. And about 10 minutes later, I got a business card back from the captain. He said, thank you for being understanding. I have never seen anyone so frightened in my life. There was nothing else I could do. What a wonderful example of seeing someone who needed help and they knew they needed help and he put his career, his job in jeopardy. He didn't mind inconveniencing all of those people. There was a guy in the aisle across from me and said, I will never fly this airline again. I'm going to miss my flight. I thought just the opposite. I'll choose this airline every time I have an opportunity because of that man was the captain of that flight. You and I can see people who need help and we can give it to them. If they know they need help, or even if they don't know they need help, we can be the ones to help them. And people who have sinned and are members of our church and they know they need help need to stay in the community of faith. And we need to put our arms around them. The second question about people and what they had done reminded me of a story of a couple in my daughter's church who were in my daughter's uh, small group. And, and uh, week after week, the wife sat in the front circle of the small group, studied her Bible with the group. The husband sat back on the other side of the room, never took part, never said a word, didn't open his Bible, didn't open any of the books. He didn't want anything to do, but he was there every week. And all of a sudden, one Thursday night, when it's time for the study group to happen, 
there was a knock on the door, and here was the husband from back there. He's a great big guy. He's six foot nine. He's a giant of a man and a wonderful guy. And he was knocking on the door, and there were big tears coming down his cheek. His eyes were red, and my daughter answered the door and put her arms around this big guy and said, what in the world happened? And he said, my wife has just run off with another member of the study group. I just found out about it. They'd been gone for two days. I didn't know where they were. Finally, I found out where they were. They're running off. She wants a divorce. They want to get married. He came in in the study group that night to put the planned preparation away, and all they talked about was that. Talked about what in the world could they do for him. And, and uh, the big guy said, uh, just pray for me. I need a lot of help. The next night and the next night of the study group, he was there, and all of a sudden he was in the, the inner circle. He was close to everybody else. And, and finally, after three weeks of trying to work with him, they began to pray, and he said, would you pray for my wife and this other guy that have run off? And a couple people in the study group said, absolutely not. We're so angry at her, we won't do it. And the big guy said, wait a minute. Haven't we been studying about grace? My wife and this guy need our prayers. And I'm going to lead out in prayer, and I want every one of you to pray too. He told me that story. And I said, what kept you in the church? He said, my small group kept me in the church. People who need help and know they need help need our love. Let's be sure that we give it to them. And then there are people who know they need help, but they don't want it. What can you do for people like that? In many churches I know, if people are in that category and they also hold an office in the church or they teach a Sabbath school lesson, a group of people, usually the pastor and the elders in the church, will get together and pray their hearts out and ask for this, the Holy Spirit to guide their actions and their words and the way they come across and they go visit this person who knows they need help but don't want it, who is an officer in the church or holds in some kind of a position and they say, we want you to stay coming to the church. We think that in the church... You can learn that you need the help and you can begin to want the help. But we don't think that you should represent the church by holding an office when what you've stated by your life is that you know you need help but you don't want it. So we're going to ask you to step down from your position or we're going to take that position away from you. But as soon as you see that you need the help of Jesus and you say to us, I've changed my life, I've repented, we're going to be the first people right here in your house to welcome you back. The Bible says one thing about treating these people who know they need help but don't seem to want it, to treat them like pagans. And I used to think that meant to ignore them and to shun them. But how do we treat pagans? We work for them with all our hearts. We put evangelistic efforts together to try to win these people we do everything we can to tell them about the love of Jesus. And that's the way we need to treat these people. I don't mean to say that there are categories of sinners that some are worse than others. But just in our relationship to the need that we have and where we get the help, it seems to me that we can do something for these categories of people. And one more thing. Have you ever been in a category of people that didn't know you needed help, but you did need it? Have you ever been in the category of people who knew you needed help and wanted it? And have you ever been in the category of people that knew you needed help, but you didn't want it? The Bible says, consider yourself. How would we like to be treated if we were in one of those categories? How would we like the other people in the church to treat us? It seems very clear to me. That's the way I think we need to treat people. Let me just say um, one thing about the last category of questions. I try to get you out of here a little bit earlier tonight, and I hope you'll go over to the cafe next door and enjoy the music and all the good things they have for you. 
I had a number of, hi, how are you? Glad you're in church. Oh, there's more. How are you? I had a number of questions about specific worship issues. And you know what these questions had to do with. Uh, you've heard them many times, and I've heard them many times. They had to do with music, especially drums. One question had to do with puppets. said that in their church there are people that don't believe that puppets is a biblical concept. <laughs> of course it isn't. The word puppets does not appear in the Bible. But neither does pathfinders. Did you know that? We don't seem to have any trouble with pathfinders at all. But um, Somebody asked me a question about crosses inside the church. And I hadn't really realized that there was a difference between crosses outside the church and crosses inside the church. There's an Adventist uh, church community in Southern California that had gotten too big for the little church that they were... Uh, that they inhabited. And they bought a bigger church in town whose congregation was dwindling. It was a Sunday church and they bought it and uh, they were so happy. The church that they bought was a historical landmark in this particular community. It was a beautiful church, a lot of intricate work done on the outside and the inside. And uh, one, I, th I guess they met one Sabbath in the church and the next day, the pastor of this new church or the church in the new building got a frantic phone call from somebody in the community who said, get down here right away. There are vandals that are defacing your church. And the pastor hung up the phone, got in the car and drove as fast as he could to the church. And when he got there, he looked up and on the roof of the church were two of the deacons of his church sawing down the cross that was on the top of the church. And they believed that the cross was some kind of an image to something and they didn't want it on the church. And the pastor said, if we can't worship under the cross of Jesus, what can we worship under? Well, people do get... Almost said a bad word. People get... People get... Uh, sorry. People get different ideas about what's appropriate and what's not. And I talked to somebody for a long time on the campground this week about crosses in the church. And then I talked to somebody else, another person who brought me the question about raising your hands in church. I think I told you the other night that it's a very biblical thing to do. But aren't we following the Pentecostal people? This person asked me. I said, no, we're following the Bible. The Pentecostal people also happen to follow the Bible on this point. There may be some other things that we don't want to follow the Pentecostals on. In fact, anything that we're following other people on and not going to the Bible on, we shouldn't be following them. But on this particular thing, raising your hands in the sanctuary is a very biblical thing. As I told you the other day, we're culturally deprived of the ability to do that. Many of us who grew up in the Adventist church just can't seem to get our hands up as much as we like to. Here, here are a couple of points that I want to make. I promise I'll quit in a few minutes here. Obviously, there are things in the Bible that allow no interpretation, no divergence of opinion. Worship the Lord alone doesn't allow us to worship any other God. We can't do it. Uh, glorify Jesus, don't glorify yourself. There's no other way to do it. We don't mix up glorifying Jesus and glorify ourselves. Obviously, there are some things in Scripture that we just, we just can't compromise. We can't, there's no other way to look at it. The seventh day is the Sabbath, period. It doesn't say, but sometimes in the week, you can have your Sabbath on Thursday. Sometimes it doesn't work that way. But there is no command in the Bible that says, how deep into the water you can wade on Sabbath afternoon or how long you can play a soccer game or even if you can on Sabbath afternoon. There are some things in the Bible where the principles are laid down and they're as clear as they can be 
But the Bible leaves open for you and me to apply those principles in our lives. And it's always at that point that we get into conflict with other people in the church because they apply the principle one way and you apply it another way and pretty soon we're having a lot of trouble with each other. I wish there was a way that all of us, when we come to these worship issues, could take a deep breath and try to focus in on what are biblical principles and what are cultural or traditional applications of the principle. And if we could agree together to take that step, I think we could quit yelling at each other about what's appropriate in the church and what kind of music and whatever. It seems to me that if there was a way that we could separate those two things, biblical principles for our own application interpretation, we'd be better off. We would still disagree. And especially on things like music, the history of the Christian church is there has always been disagreement about church music. If we had tonight uh, time to do this, I'd love to play for you an ancient Gregorian chant, uh, the kind of music that reverberates through monasteries as monks learn these Latin songs and, and sing them. I doubt if there's anybody here tonight that would call Gregorian chants contemporary Christian music. But you know when Gregorian chants were first introduced into the church, there were many people that refused to allow them to be sung in the church because they sounded so much like the secular music of the day. Way back hundreds and hundreds of years ago, centuries ago, that was the problem. I was telling somebody the other day in a particular city in, uh, in Europe, in one particular cathedral, there was a new teenager who assumed the post of organist at this cathedral. And he began to play his music every Sunday in the cathedral. And as he sat down to play, large groups of worshipers would get up and walk out of the church and complain that this teenager was mixing strange tones into the music that they were used to hearing in church. Oh, I didn't tell you the teenage organist's name was Johann Sebastian Bach. And if people wanted to choose sacred classical music for the organ today, that's the place where they go, to Bach's organ music. But at the time when it was introduced, it seemed strange, and people were getting up and walking out of church behind, be, because of it. And I could tell you story after story after story after story about the same kind of thing. I got a call back to a church on the east coast of the States and they asked me to talk about church music, music for worship, what I come back. And I found a situation in the church where the people who sat on this side of the church were classical musicians who loved classical music, who thought the only kind of worship music they wanted in the church was classical music. And the people who sat on this side of the music uh, of the church loved contemporary Christian music and they thought that was the kind of music they wanted in church. And the amazing thing that I found was the people that liked the classical music always sat here and the contemporary Christian musicians, they always sat here and not only would they not sit on the opposite side of the church, they wouldn't even talk to the people that were on the opposite side of the church. And it seemed to me that the problem in that church was not music. It was the way they treated each other. And even if we could come to a place where we agree on what biblical principles are and we agree what personal interpretations are, we're still going to disagree, but we can do it in the spirit that the Bible asks us to do it. Romans chapter 12 says this kind of thing, beginning with verse 10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord, be joyful in hope. 
but bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. What would happen in our churches if we follow that kind of advice? Over in chapter 14, the same kind of counsel. Stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Now, I've got to say this to classical musicians and people who love contemporary music. Live in love toward each other. Realize that your experience and background and your culture and your taste are going to dictate that you like certain things. But quit pointing the finger across the church and saying, we're right, you're wrong, we're holy, you're sinful, we're on the way to heaven, you're on the way to the other place. Live in love toward each other. Honor each other. Uh, to my contemporary Christian music friends, sing to the Lord with all your might, but glorify God. Don't glorify yourself. I say to my classical music organist friends, play the organ with all your might as loud as you can, but glorify God. Don't glorify yourself. To people who play the electric guitar and people who play the, the harp, Glorify God. Don't glorify yourself. And to my contemporary Christian musicians, friends, live in love toward the people around here. If, if you are playing contemporary Christian music and praising God at 2 o'clock in the morning and somebody in that tent right over there is trying to sleep, don't excuse what you're doing by saying you're praising God. Because while you are, you're not living in love to those people right there. <laughs> Just before I walked in here today, I walked past the teen shed and there was a man walking by who was so agitated at the music. He had his hand on this ear and his hand on this ear and a frantic look on his eyes. And he was walking by the teen shed like this. And I said, are you okay? He said, listen to that. Are they doing that in America as well? And I said, yeah, but in America we know it's the Kiwis that sent the music over to us that way. <laughs> and you know, he did the same thing you did. He laughed and he kind of relaxed a little bit. But I want to say to my traditional, classical-oriented friends, live in love to the young people who love to praise God here on the stage of the youth tent. I think it's one great reason why we are out here in this corner of the campground and they are way over there on that corner of the campground. But those of you who love the worship over there, love the fact that the people in here are worshiping God. And if you don't like the music, go back over there. And if we don't like your music, we can come here. But let's not dislike each other. Let's live in love toward each other. I've taken too much time, I'm sorry. God bless you as you put these principles to work. See you next time.